Welcome back to the Home Recording Show. This is episode 316. I am John Tidy, and I'm joined today by my co-host, production sound mixer Ryan Canestro. Hey, guys. And with professional voice actor and YouTube creator Mike Delgadio. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. A lot of professionals. <laughs> you can find Mike online at boothjunkie.com and boothjunkie on YouTube. So, Mike, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a voice actor full time. Like you said, I make YouTube videos. Uh, you can find me at Booth Junkie. And really, I just uh, I do whatever sort of narration anybody wants me to do: radio and TV commercials, audio books, e-learning, IVR. I kind of you have words you want me to say, I'll say them for you. Nice. <laughs> the life of a voice actor, I suppose. But it'll cost you. It'll cost you. That's right. Dearly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you're pretty active in the the audio, the the voice actor community yeah. on YouTube. I, I see you all the time doing stuff with Curtis Judd yep. or with um, uh, Sound Speeds. Sound Speeds or Podcastage. And, and some of the yeah, other channels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Podcast. Yeah. yeah. And I enjoy all that stuff. Oh, that's good. That's good. You know, the, I like audio. I mean, my my knowledge of audio is so much... It's narrower than, narrower than a lot of music production, but so much of what we do, of course, carries over from, from one to the other. And I've learned so much from, you know, from you, from you know, other music producers. Uh, it's just been, it's been, a, I really like the collaborative part of YouTube. It's really, it makes it, it makes it fun. And so if you guys don't know about Booth Junkie, Mike makes videos primarily on voiceover techniques, setting up a home studio, for voice acting and lots of microphone reviews and comparisons. Yeah, gear, lots of gear reviews. It's sort of the channel sort of mor morphed for a while into gear reviews. Once I guess you break a certain threshold, everybody wants to send you gear. <laughs> and that's how I found you. I had right? seen you shoot out something like a year ago. Yeah. Um, John mentioned he's going to be on the show tomorrow. I'm like, I've seen that guy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it, for a while, and now it's kind of exhausting. I'm a little bit burned out on mic reviews and mic comparisons. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's certainly interesting uh, to hear all the different microphones. You know, from a voice acting perspective, not every mic is necessarily right for voice acting. Um, and so it's fun, to, it's fun to shoot them out, even when you get a mic that doesn't necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily work. Well, that's how I started getting at the NAMM shows, walking through, and everyone's got a new mic out. And you're like... Okay, so it captures sound. Yeah. Okay, go on. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm just being a jerk right now, but there, I, I love microphones and yeah. every microphone has its own place and yeah. I love to play with them all. But it gets to a point where when there's just thousands of choices, you just right. kind of look at the whole thing and go, uh, right. I don't know. I have this one that works really good. Right, right. And, you know, it does seem like they, they really get into nuances. Well, this one is great for snare bottom. Or this one's great for splash, you know, when it gets like hyper specific. Like, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, and a, 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 a fifty-seven is probably just going to work everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think where I first found you was, I think you had already started doing Reaper tutorials on your channel. This was back in the Reaper Five yeah. uh, times, and then I gave you a shout out on my channel. A bunch of people. Um, subscribe to you i think the algorithm caught you and it pushed you even further and then you shot way past me and subscribers yeah. like like within six months of that uh, whatever there was there must have been some little magical you know segment of video i did because i don't I, and i don't know what it was but we never know yeah I, but i i do have to you know i should you know once again extend my thanks to you because it was that shout out one that made me continue to make videos it's like all right well actually it's motivating because i was getting like I had nothing, you know, I, no, nobody was seeing anything. And you gave me that shout out and so many people came over and started watching my videos, which I was super, super grateful for, but it was really motivating. I was like, man, somebody, somebody said, Hey, great job. Thank you so much for doing it. I, and I really appreciated it. And it's been, it's been motivating. It's been motivating this whole time. I'm, I'm really, really grateful for it for both the kinds of words you said to me publicly and privately. I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I appreciate what you do. And I really like your production style or the way you present things because I don't think you take yourself too seriously. I don't. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, you, you'll leave in mistakes and everything. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of the mic comparisons are just it's, you, you start rolling and then maybe you'll flub the intro a couple of times. But... For sure, for sure. <laughs> 
but then sure. you, once you start you're you're just going and that's the that's the whole video yeah yeah and it's it, i really do try and make it i try and make it as real i mean we all make mistakes you know i i goof up i fump for um you know, mouth noises, all that stuff. I want it to feel real with not a, a huge amount of polish to it uh, because that's the reality of it, right? That's the, sort of the reality of how it goes. And there is a human condition. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And uh, I think that it's it just is the, it's an aesthetic that worked for me because in the beginning, I didn't really, I still don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a particularly facile video editor. I'm not really great at all that stuff. And once again, shout out to you probably 90% of my videos have been edited in Reaper because of the things that I learned from you. I bought your video, <laughs> I bought your video pack and, uh, it's been, it's been probably my favorite video editor. And that's what helped me just keep, keep making, keep making more and more content because of the stuff I learned from you. I just watched the video John made about editing this show uh, a couple days ago and I was fascinated and I'm like, I'm on that show and I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, that that course that I made was kind of a slow starter. Mm. People didn't really get it. And then like March 2020, it's just like total sales at that point just started to double. Is that right? Like now it's my best course. Oh, that's fantastic. Like no one cared the first, I don't know, four months of that. Interesting. And then now it's my best selling course. It's funny. Do you, but do you know what made that happen? Was it? I th I think it was. It just might have been like, a pandemic. Must have been the pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people wanted to continue their band practices, put out music videos and stuff like yeah. that, and they didn't want to start learning video editing. Really, like, uh, like get into a subscription with for Premiere or something like that. A lot of people, their their systems couldn't handle Resolve. Or that's just like, it's just too different. They're already recording in Reaper. It's just a matter of importing a video and syncing it up. And, you know, then they can have something for YouTube to share. Yeah. Because they wanted to keep um, keep practicing, keep releasing music and stuff like that. Right. So I think that was part of it. Um, and there are lots of free videos about that, but nothing that's as deep. And I had all the presets in there presets. Uh, that makes it a lot it's simpler. And I think, you know, for, for so many of us audio editors, if you've never worked with video editing, having the, the video and the audio just be on separate tracks like that, I find it far more confusing to use the NLEs than I do. Doing it in Reaper just for me makes a ton more sense, probably because it, it conforms to the way that I edit audio. And I can yeah, you just- You might be an audio guy. Yeah, it just and you just edit video the exact same way. I don't have to learn two different ways to do things, and I can do everything that I need to do. Like it doesn't do motion graphics particularly well, but just for cutting, just for cutting together video, it's well, so a lot fast. of us audio guys are being thrown into video because we're making YouTube videos. We're obviously doing a video podcast. When my intent was only to do audio because that's all I want to do. Right. But now here we are and all of us have to do it. So if there's a down and dirty way, a simple way in the tools we're already using, why not? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think with the video podcast, uh, you got to stay uh, a, a little more alert right now because everyone can see you, <laughs> see you when you're slouching in your chair and stuff like that. And I think the conversation stays a little more lively. <laughs> And I got to keep on my toes to make sure the OBS doesn't crash on me again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you are a voice actor, voice over artist. The terms seem to be interchangeable, yeah. but obviously they are different jobs. Yeah. I would like to know how you got started. You had a voice first. Yeah. How did you get yeah. start getting into recording? Yeah. Were you at home first or did you get called into a professional? Uh, home, uh, home first, I suppose. When I was a kid. I, I had a deep voice early. My dad has a deep voice. I had a deep voice early. Walking around like 12 sounding like that? Yeah, yeah. Big radio voice. Hey, dad, how's it going? Yeah, and people are always just like, you sound like a radio guy. You sound like a radio and, and so I thought, I like music. I like to talk. I got a voice for radio. I'm going to be a radio DJ. And then I went and like interviewed 
to be like a, uh, I, not, 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 not interview, but I went and like watched a board op guy be a radio guy. I'm like, this seems like misery. This seems like a job I really, really would not enjoy to try and work my way up, you know, to become, you know, morning radio guys. Like that's it's a, a long walk, that's a long slog. And there's no, no security in it whatsoever. Your radio station is going to change format any, any time and you're all fired. And then you have to move to Milwaukee or whatever it is. Uh, so I, I gave up on that uh, for a long time. And then uh, years, 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 years later, 20 years later, I relocated to another city. M- met a girl. We decided to get married. I moved to her city. I knew literally nobody. And uh, I'm sort of like one of these people that's a lifelong learner. I like to learn stuff. So I went, I'll just go to the local college and I'll take a, you know, an adult education class. Maybe I'll meet some like-minded people. I'll make some new friends. And the, I was going to sign up, I think it was for black and white photography. And when I looked through the course catalog, there was a class called the art and business of voiceover. I'll do that. Why not? That sounds like fun. And that, that night, you know, they, they had us get on mic and I heard myself through their big pro tools rig with the really nice monitors. And I got into the booth and I heard myself in the headphones and I went, uh, I'm home. Like it instantly, it instantly felt like home. A bit of a junkie, would you say? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, it was, it was like that first, that first hit. Cause that, I think the very next day I bought a microphone, I started recording and I bet I've recorded 90 Five percent of the days since that time, I love it. I love it. It felt like absolute home, and I, you know, practice, 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 practice. And by the end, by the time, uh, by the time the twelve week course had ended, uh, I was getting a coach, getting coached, and the coach introduced me to her agent. The agent signed me, and I. So I had an agent like crazily like 12 weeks after after my first time in front of oh, wow. a microphone and uh we've been together ever since and just been recording ever since and now it's transitioned from my hobby to my my full-time gig so yeah about 10 years that was about 10 years ago nice yeah. i don't know if i ever listened to myself recorded or on a microphone until we started the podcast and i know you didn't like it no. Did you do the podcast before no. uh, before your YouTube channel? Have you was this did this? Yes. Yeah. We we started the podcast in two thousand eight. Oh wow! And we did that for about seven years. Wow. Is that right? Yeah. It was like five years. We didn't miss a week. Then it started getting drawn out because I was just so crazy busy. And then um, then we just kind of rebooted it after kind of a five year hiatus. Yeah. Finally doing season Some two. Of that. Season, this is season three. We're we calling it three. Yeah, w- this was it was two hundred and fifty something episodes. Wow, kind of in a row. Wow, uh, definitely yeah, every week towards the end. But it was yeah, it was weekly, and and nothing prepared in advance. A lot of times, <laughs> we never had shows already edited, banked. Wow, ready to publish. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was uh, it was every week we had a new show. We yeah, there was never a banked show. I mean, we would obviously prepare to do shows and make segments and prep all kinds of uh, examples and I would do a lot of testing of uh, shooting out mics and things like that mm. which was a lot of fun and I, I think I want to start doing a little more of that going forward because I, I did enjoy it and it it did help me figure stuff out and I actually went back and listened to one of our shootouts recently like um, two days ago and I listened to a shootout I did and stuff I didn't like then I liked better now I was like oh I would totally use that ribbon mic on a bass cabinet for feedback but that when I heard it then I was like ugh <laughs> that's interesting that's super cool yeah. that's really cool the main benefit of the podcast uh in, in it, like we did it to continue learning mm. and to to talk about what we're passionate about we also helped us reach more people and and to make connections that we never would have had in in a, the traditional like working in a studio sort of thing we just wouldn't have these connections so like talking to matt mcglynn from Recording hacks, microphone parts, right. and Roswell Audio. I'm a fan. He sends us mics. Did he? I've been trying to get in touch with him. I haven't been successful. And so. that one's great. I just got mine, the- um, Is that the, the Delphos? The mini. No, it's the Mini 67. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. And it's it nice. definitely has a transformer in it. Big, fat transformer. Sounds amazing. Um, I, I definitely want to do a nice big shootout with that. Cool. But uh, fantastic sounding mic. Um, Definitely has that vintage character and that warmth and that clarity. 
Uh, that's the kind of stuff I like. Yeah, that's definitely uh, the uh, a Roswell mic is definitely on my on my on my wish list. Progressively working through my wish list, but there's definitely a and and Matt's a great guy. We did a ribbon mic shootout on the show where we put together sixty thousand dollars of ribbon microphones, and we had just everything. And um, we had uh, a guy from Royer coming over and dropping mics off at my studio. Uh, it was it was crazy. We did. I think it was literally every ribbon mic that was available at that time. And we even got to work with Randy Coppinger, who was a friend of the show. Um, he worked at one of the Disney voiceover studios. So we got to go record on the original ribbon mic that did Dumbo from the, the late forties. Like it and was an old RCA. They still, um, it was, yeah. yeah. The, um, oh, what is the name of that 44 thing? 44 maybe? Maybe. It's a um, directional and it has like a whole chamber system with horse hair know. in it. Oh, I don't know what that one. That's cool. And, um, and we had Corey Burton with us to do all the voiceover. Um, he's the voice of the tram at Disneyland. Cool. The guy's amazing. Oh, that's so cool. We were able to pull off some crazy stuff for uh, a little podcast. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. There wasn't a lot of competition at that time. There wasn't a lot of people doing There weren't a lot of podcasts, podcasts about yeah, at the time. Sure. When we would say we have a podcast, people would say, what's that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't like and, the punchline to every comedian has a podcast. Yeah. Right. It was, it was like podcast had was like starting to like become a thing and it seemed to die off and then like right. three years ago or something that like came back stronger than ever right, right. so yeah you were pr- really interesting because pr- we were so burnt out on doing podcasts <laughs> before anyone got into by the podcasts. time people knew what they were right. yeah it was probably you and adam curry and keith and the girl and the home recording show was probably it was almost it. that silly like <laughs> leo laporte was just starting to put together his podcast network <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's cool i tried my hand at it uh, a podcast whose name i will never mention but i did i recorded like 10 or 15 episodes of a podcast solo and i just i couldn't sustain it so it's really super super impressive that you guys have been able to that you were able to sustain like 250 episodes is unbelievable when you're doing it all just in time when you're not banking episodes and With season three we're trying to bank episodes but we fell behind <laughs> so this is <laughs> this is going out in a couple of days <laughs> We do have a lot of stuff planned and we, we are going to get back on that schedule, but, um, it's, it's great to be back and it's fun and I definitely missed it. That's really cool. All right. So let's get back to the home studio. Yeah. Uh, you're currently in probably the third home studio maybe that we've seen on, on your YouTube. Yeah, probably. You've always been working in a vocal booth. Did you, you probably had a DIY vocal booth before you bought the Whisper Room. Right? Yeah, I, I started with a DIY booth, mostly just like treating my treating my basement room uh, in the house I was living in at the time. I had the luxury of having a basement that with a, with a tall enough ceiling that I could that I could work in. And it was like moving blankets and just doing my best to, to, to do whatever I could and saving every penny from every job to finally save up for a Whisper Room. And I used a Whisper Room for, I don't know, seven or eight years, I suppose, the same one. And the only reason I'm not using that anymore is because the house I moved to, now that I'm on the, the East Coast, um, the ceiling in this in this room is one inch too low for the whisper room. And you can't really cut them up. You can't really cut up a whisper room. Uh, and so I ended up having to do a DIY one. So this is the one that you, if you're watching uh, on YouTube, it, it will, uh, it, it's a, just a DIY just a DIY job out of MDF and, and, um, uh, like, a, a mineral wool. And it's been great. Cause it's, uh, this one is nice. Cause it's bigger, bigger than a whisper room. It's six by six, but acoustically it was much more challenging because it was exactly six by six by yeah, six. Aren't good. It's a cube. This one is a perfect cube, uh, because it's short. And luckily I'm not, I'm only five, nine. So, uh, but I mean, acoustically there was like incredible, incredible standing incredible standing waves in it so it took a lot of extra yeah there's work. some challenges there yeah it took a lot of extra work to get it dialed in but now I've, I've got it pretty dialed in the the lucky thing about voiceover is it's mostly at this volume i don't have to worry about it being you know it's very rare that i'm super loud and so you can sort of hide some of the ills in the booth a little bit when you don't have to get really loud well and you're also the engineer so you're listening for it yeah. too so yeah yeah. You're able to work your your talent and engineer coming together and really having that symbiotic relationship. Yeah. It's been good. It's been good. I like I like having the I like having the booth and the experience of building a booth is was was fun. Yeah. What are some of the common issues with 
DIY or, or vocal booths in general? I think for voiceover, the most common one you get is, I think a lot of people think their vocal booth is supposed to be small. It seems like everyone wants to build a booth and it's always four by four or it's three by three, or they're trying to fit it into a closet. And that creates often a, a standing wave at like 300 hertz, you know, just whatever the wavelength is. It's usually between 250 and 400 hertz. And you get a standing wave that's right squarely and often the sweet spot of your voice that you have to try and you have to try and figure out. And really the only solution for the voice actor is to add more and more acoustic treatment to try and get that standing wave to knock down a little bit, which just makes your booth narrow, <laughs> narrower and narrower and narrower. Uh, I think, you know, it's supposed to be something like six, six inches worth of mineral wool is really what will knock down that resonant frequency, that standing wave. And when your booth is only, you know, four feet wide, trying to make it narrower like that can be, can be really challenging. So there's that, just trying to get it acoustically sound when you realize you have to put a lot of acoustic treatment in it. Uh, and then for, for it, we're in the booth a lot of time for hours at a time, exhaling all this carbon dioxide. So it gets hot and it gets progressively more poisonous. <laughs> the air gets progressively more poisonous. So unless you're opening the door or you've got a really, really quiet ventilation system, People don't realize like how hot and how tiring, how exhausting it can be to be in like a high carbon dioxide environment for a long time. So you got to, you got to open and close a door um, I, because so many times the, if you work on a ventilation system, it's hard to get one that's quiet so that it Forget doesn't. Forget about rumble. it. I've spent hours looking into that and trying really and revising. It's, it's brutal. It's really hard. It's really hard when really the easiest thing to do is just pause, you know, open and close the door a few times and get some, get some fresh air, step out, you know, and, uh, you know, I keep a fan in there. So when I'm not in there, I turn on a fan on and just try and blow as much hot air out. It's a cheap and workable solution, but it does limit how, how long you can work it at one time, unless you're really willing to sweat. And, uh, voice actors, we generally have to be willing to sweat in our booth. <laughs> because it gets so it gets so hot i mean those are those are the common challenges uh and then you know working with you know if you're working at home same challenges that so many other people have except because our volumes are low compared to like recording a a guitar or, or a singer that's really loud is the difference between our voice and the noise floor often isn't that isn't that much. So you're, if you're competing with a, a pc fan or a real fan or you know the humming of a light it can actually be in your voice as opposed to a guitar. You know, if you're trying to, you know, mic a guitar cabinet, that's way up. It's going to way overpower the noise floor. Our voice is actually fairly, fairly close to the noise floor. And so you have to really be cognizant of any moving part that's around you. Like I can hear, I can hear the fan from my ATEM device right here. And it, it makes me crazy. It's the, literally the only moving part in this whole room and I can still hear it. And you know, hopefully you guys can't, but I'm, you know, super in tune to it. And as a voice actor, if I tried to turn this recording into audible, it would probably fail for a noise floor issue because of a little tiny moving fan on the device. So it, when we don't work at super high volumes, any source of noise can be a challenge. So those are, you know, common, common things. And memorizing your neighbor's gardening schedule. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I know, you know, Wednesday morning is garbage day. Thursday is when the guys come over and mow my neighbor's yard. So I can't record for like two hours while he, while he's having his yard work done. And yeah. Yeah. Well, you could plan fam family time around those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah a lot of the, a lot of the people that I do uh, Reaper sessions with, they're getting into voiceover and then their times to start are like 8 p.m. They'll like record eight to two. Yeah. And I'm like, I think that's, that's insane personally, because I'm dead tired at eight, eight o'clock. It's, it's not, yeah, that's not uncommon is, you know, a lot of people, if they're in apartment buildings, they're like, I have to wait for my neighbor to go to sleep before I can start to record because I can hear their television through the wall or I can hear, you know, they're clonking around upstairs and I got to wait for them to go to bed before I go into my three or four hour recording session. That's not at all uncommon for new voice actors or, you know, city, city dwelling voice actors in an apartment. That's really common. Sucks, but it's common. Do you think that is entirely necessary to pass like the audiobook 
guidelines. The tools have gotten better. Um, you know, back when uh, back when it was just a gate was the best thing that you could do for noise. It, it, a lot of that noise, you know, clonk, somebody clonking around, there's like nothing you can do if it if it occurs the same time as you're you, as you're speaking. Now that we've got like the Isotope RX suite or, or the uh, Accusonus ERA suite that can do a lot more of that noise reduction, that does give you a lot, a lot more freedom in ways that the audiobook companies don't mind. The audiobook companies mind it if your gate, you know, goes down to minus infinity and you can hear that thing clicking on and off. Um, but, you know, now that we've got, now that we've got some of the better tools out there, it does make it easier. Um mouth clicks, you know, all those tools make it so much easier than what we had to do. And God forbid we had to do it on tape, but at least, you know, now, now that the, now that we've got some of these plugins that can help the, the repair plugins have really come a long way. I only do audiobooks on cassette. <laughs> I was actually just listening to an old MP3 of something that was only on cassette. It's brutal. Mike, do you think we need a vocal booth to work in voiceover? Is that a hundred percent necessary? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. It, it's, you know, you're, you need a, you need a good place to record, of course. And so long as it meets the requirements of, you know, whatever engineer you're working with, I usually go by like audibles. They have pretty good guidelines. And as long as you can meet their guidelines, no reverb, quiet noise floor, you could do it in a room like this, right? If, if, if you don't have to worry about ambient noise, like I happen to be in the lower level of a house. So the walls all around me are concrete. The only thing I have to do is silence the people walking above me, but my noise floor is perfectly low. I've got acoustic treatment like crazy on these walls. So there's no, there's no reverb. And you're uh, pretty so, far off the mic right now too. Yeah. I'm probably, you know, 10 inches, 10 inches off the mic. Um, so yeah, you don't need to, you don't need to have a booth. The reason uh, voice actors have a booth is for consistency so that the recording I make today sounds like the recording I make next week sounds like the recording I make a year from now. And especially if you're doing corporate kind of voiceover work, you'll have, it's not unusual to get a job that you record today that has pickups a year later. And so you want your, you want your space to be consistent every single time. And it should not. Or if you're doing an audio book, you, you want to have from chapter to chapter be the same, yeah. and that's all exactly. going to record over days, weeks, or months. Exactly. Exactly. And so wherever your space is, it has to sound, it has to meet requirements, but it has to sound the same. In a basement, a lot of times there'll be a furnace that runs all winter. And so your sound's going to be different. So you have the booth in order to try and create the the most consistent environment. And like I said, it can't sound like any particular environment. It can't sound like a room. It can't, it should not be live. We, we strive for acoustically dead so that our voice can't be placed in a particular room. It can't sound like I'm in a kitchen or in a, or in a living room or in a, in a studio. We want essentially almost no live. Disembodied. Uh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of times as a voice actor, you know, when I do do, you know, audio drama type stuff, that engineer will sometimes need to put me into a room, into an environment. So he'll put a, you know, uh, uh, a, a reverb and I, it, what do they call it? An, an IR, a convolutional reverb. Convolution. Yeah. He'll put a convolution on me to put me into the room with the other actor. So, so much of, of what we do as voice actors, I never interact with the other people. I never see them. I have no idea what their line is, how their line is going to be delivered. We all do it very much asynchronously. And the engineer will go and make the set, make the, the set in our mind where he'll put us all in, in the room or in the environment. And so the, the more dead our environment is, the easier it is for them to, to yeah, put us into given the them what they need to work with. So there's no coloration, it's clean, it's crisp, and then they can add whatever, take away whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Luckily, some of the, you know, some of the tools have gotten a little bit better, like the D reverbs and stuff like that can help if your, if your environment isn't perfect. Uh, but you know, they always say, you know, fix it at the source. The more but yeah also don't depend on it being horribly bad and try to fix it it's that's for taking off just that hint, hint. of something exactly. not you know recording in a tunnel exactly exactly and so that's you know that's really why we why we have the booth but is it mandatory nah i wouldn't say so but they're nice they're certainly nice they are certainly nice and hot and small <laughs> you you brought up the 
the fact that you work with other actors, but you don't often, you don't usually interact with them. Have you had the opportunity to work in a group, in a, in a group session in a studio? It's been a long time. Yeah. And usually, even still, they're not in the same booth. There's rarely eye contact with another actor. So a couple of things that I've done, I, I had gone into a studio and there were five ISO booths. And we would, you know, we were all working off our script and luckily our headphone feeds, we could hear the other actor, but I still couldn't see and play off them. It was all still purely by voice. So even in those cases, it's rare that we would stand around a mic and, and do anything like that. But, you know, most of the time, I'd say probably 99% of the work for me has been asynchronous where I have no idea what you got a list of lines. Yeah. You got a list of lines. And if I have, if I have any doubt as to what I think that other actor is going to do, I'll react three different ways. And I'll just give the engineer, you know, three different reactions to that, to try and guess what the other actor is going to do and just try and give the, the engineer who's cutting it all together, uh, have them have it make sense as best I can. You should start telling the engineers that you're only going to do it on a ribbon mic and you all have to be in the same room <laughs> and standing the requisite distance for everyone to be balanced. That's the only way you'll work. Yeah, That's the right. only way it does work. And that is the purest way to do it. That's so, true. you know, yeah. Yeah, put that in your writer. I'm ready to get fired. <laughs> there you go. That'll get you there real fast. <laughs> Wear a cape too. Yeah. I mean, and mo you know, the thing that, the thing that I do most, I, I'm on a podcast, a weekly podcast, and, uh, that's an acting, you know, it's an acting gig. Um, but the actors, we're all over the, we're all over the globe. Um, and my engineer, you know, the engineer is, it's not my engineer, the engineer for the podcast is in Spain and most of the other actors, we've got them in, in Europe and West coast, East coast, you know, all, all, just all over the place. So it would be really hard to even get us all in the same room because somebody's probably going to be working at midnight to yeah, somebody else's 7 a.m. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just easier to just say, have all your lines in by Saturday, please. Is your booth set up with with a, a screen and cameras and stuff like that? You could yeah. uh, work through, through Zoom or something? Yeah, yeah. We do it. A lot of times we do that. So in, in voice acting, um, a lot of times, especially since the pandemic, um, I connect my studio to other studios. There's a, maybe you've used it. There's a technology that we use a lot in voice acting called Source Connect, where it's essentially, it was the replacement for ISDN. And it was the precursor to what we have now with like Riverside and all, all of those things where you could essentially set up a high enough bandwidth connection between two studios. And they would just drop it in as a plug-in into their, into their DAW and my mic would be hot on their end. Uh, and so we'd always have the mic hot and now a lot more, they want it on zoom. So it used to be that they would just have, they would just have me in their ears. And then the client would be, you know, listening on whatever the studio monitors were, were there. But now a lot of times it's weird. They want me on camera but they, they never want to be on camera. Almost always I'm looking at the, you know, the, the, the no video icon on my end, but they want to, they want to see me for whatever reason, uh, which is fine. You know, it's not too much different from, from a YouTube video. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my booth, I mean, that booth is where I record all the YouTube videos too. So there's, right. it's the same, it's the same camera and it's actually so that there's no noise in there the computer is here in my control room with a long you know hdmi over cat5 run into into that room bluetooth and all that stuff in there so that yeah there's no no moving parts in in that room at all nothing that can make noise awesome if anyone's looking for a a free version of the source connect there's a app called sonobus which is really good i use that along with zoom for mix critiques so they can play their mix and I can I, I, I can hear that in stereo through my Reaper or as a standalone app. That's great. In real yeah. time. That's cool. And yeah, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, um, protocol instead of server-based. I mean, you still need good Wi-Fi or, or internet connection, but it's- Is it, it like a web well. RTC thing? Is that is that a like a Chrome only type deal or is it, is it something No, different? it's it's a plugin or a standalone app. Oh, that's and you cool. Just, you create a room, give them name, password if you want and then you, you can connect that's really actually easily. it's sonobus i hadn't heard of that that's really yeah. cool ryan do you have any questions for mike yeah i was actually just going to tell mike about uh i was watching one of his videos the other day about how to set up reaper for voiceover 
And I just went into my son's room. I'm like, hey, come on in here, watch this, because he's interested in voiceover. He's been he's in an art school and mm-hmm. he's a great artist, but he's becoming more interested in doing characters and voiceover. Sure. So I sat him down and I've been he's been using Audacity and I've been trying to get him on Reaper. So I use your video of how to set up Reaper for voiceover specifically to try to uh, bring him over to the dark side. <laughs> That's <laughs> really cool. And he sat and watched the whole 20 something minutes and he's wow. like, this is really cool. Oh, you could do that. You could do that. I'm like, yeah, yeah you could customize it any way you want. Yeah. That's what you love about the the young minds. They're like so open to all the possibilities. Like, oh yeah, we can just, you know, it's not confusing for them. It's just opportunities. That's yeah. great. super cool that he, he watched it. And it, it will serve as an advantage. Anytime, uh, certainly in my experience, in, and certainly since the pandemic, the more technical expertise that you can have on your own, the more you can be your own engineer, the more valuable you are. So that's really, that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I brought him and my daughter came in and we did a whole, he wrote like a script for something he was going to animate. And we did all the characters and recorded it. It was like a river scene. So I put like river sound effects in the background and, you know, other little sound effects. And we did a whole little, it was like a 45 second thing. And he's like, I don't mean to be a jerk, dad, but I finally think your job is cool. <laughs> like I can actually see like what, how, how this benefits me. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. That's now cool. that's cool. Now that I did something for you, it's cool. <laughs> I get it. Uh, certainly my kids have been the same way where like, it's like, yeah, dad, it's so boring. It's so boring. And then mm-hmm. when they go into the booth, they're like, I have to record something for school. I've got a report that I have to deliver. Or, you know, it's got, and I go, well, come on down to the booth and we'll, and they hear themselves in the headphones like, oh, wait, this is cool. And yeah. I don't sound like I'm talking over my, you know, my AirPods into my, into my laptop. Oh yeah, this is cool. I'm like, yeah, see, it's cool. Yeah. It is a, a benefit to have a professional recording studio. <laughs> in your home. There is, yeah, there is some benefit to that. Yeah. 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 I was wondering if you ever ran into our friend, Jordan Reynolds. I have never run into our friend. Okay, Jordan he does a... He does a course called uh, Audio Ninja, I think it's called. Okay. And it's about voiceover. Mm-hmm. So I was just, just curious. Yeah, he's out here now. He was in uh, Colorado, right? Now he's uh, out in Burbank. I, I'm sure I have. I, Jordan, I hope I'm not insulting you. I, I'm sure I have. The name doesn't ring a bell, but the name Audio Ninja rings a bell. But I hope I'm not conflating it because I think there's a guy named Microphone Ninja also, and I hope I'm not conflating the two. Either way. Okay. It's and I know a sound thing. mixer who's the audio ninja. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But I'm sure if you heard his voice, we've known him for a long time. So we've seen the progress too. Um, his stuff now is really, really good. That's great. That's great. That's one of the great things I I, I, I love about voiceover is that uh, so far I have yet to find a voice that can't find a, a, a client or can't find a, a use. People are always like, oh, I, I don't have a voice for a voiceover. I'm like, well, my voice isn't necessarily as marketable as it once was, you know, having the big, deep, you know, authoritative announcer voice. I get so often like, could you do it less announcery? Could you just sound like a regular guy? And the big, you know, the, the great big voices, they're not as marketable, but every voice has a marketability to it. And certainly the youthful voices. Well, and now more than ever, just a natural voice, a personality, a a vibe. It doesn't particularly have to be this amazing broadcast voice. Sure, people are looking for more of just a vibe, a feel, uh, a a personality. Right. I mean, just think about how many, you know, radio, uh, certainly like TV advertisements that are trying to look like TikTok videos or Instagram reels, where they're taking all of the polish out of it. So that it just does feel real and authentic, and and there's a there's a spot for there's a spot it's for. We push that direction. Yeah, I'm I'm waiting for it to swing back the other direction. Probably, Another ten years, you'll be uh, on top of the world. You'd be the most sought after guy in the world. We want <laughs> radio announcement. We've had enough of this fake yeah. reality stuff. Right. Let's get polish. Right. Yeah. Right now, it's all kitsch. Like you know, every once in a while, I get an aud- audition. They're like, "Could you do the in a world guy voice?" Like. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's, but you know, probably 90% of my, my auditions are like natural. Sound like the guy, sound like you're talking over a fence to your neighbor. Don't sound announcery. And that could mm-hmm. be for big, big brands, you know, banks and all sorts of stuff where it normally be come to national bank. And they don't want that anymore. They really yeah. don't want that anymore. I just remembered the first voiceover recording I ever did. So I was, this is before I went to audio school. I had 
a kind of, a, I wouldn't even call it a home studio. I had a computer and some microphones. I was in a band and stuff. And it was between, I think it was maybe the summer before I went to recording school. I was working at this this little department store uh, in Northern Ontario. And we would always have this guy come in to order or to buy cigarettes. And he had just this amazing voice and he had no experience. He's never worked in voiceover or anything like that. And so me and, and the other cashiers were just kept noticing his voice. And every night we would have to do these announcements to tell the, the customers that the store is closing. So I got this idea. I, I was leaving the store. I didn't want to do this, this thing anymore. And I didn't. it was annoying that people have to do it every single night. And it's different every night. So I was like, I'm going to ask him if he wants to do these announcements. And I'll just record it for free and give the store a tape. And so we did it. We just brought him over to my basement and I paid him with a pack of cigarettes or a <laughs> carton of cigarettes. And it was, it was weird, but, if, but really fun. And that was, that's hysterical. I, I totally forgot about that until just now, but it, <laughs> I hope just you had have this those wonderful, like, and you I don't, insert I them absolutely here. Don't. Ah. I don't, but it was, it was, it was fun. And we just had a couple different versions, uh, for like, you know, had the store hours when they're going to open again. And if it was a holiday, we had another version of that. And I just recorded on the computer, put it onto a tape and then gave it to the store. And I don't think I ever got to hear it actually play because it was right before I was, I was. Can we get the play. script and have you produce Mike to <laughs> get it exactly as it was? He doesn't have the smoker voice. <laughs> Smooth, marble, marble. It was like Kathleen Turner. Yeah, it was something like yeah, that. Right, guy. right. Yeah. But yeah, that was, I, I don't know, that was a really good memory, I guess. That's that funny. I just had repressed. <laughs> <laughs> so much years of Pro Tools rage had, had <laughs> suppressed that. Not missing Pro Tools. Um, my son was asking about that too when we were watching all the videos. And I was like, yeah, you can't do this in Pro Tools. And then I showed him your video, John. And I said, look what else you can, you could change the colors. You can make it look like something totally different. And he was like, Oh, okay. I'm in. He's like, you can customize it any way you want. So I, I think I might have made a Reaper fan between the two of you guys for my son. That's great. That's great. Well, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Reaper. I've never had to use anything else. I love it. Lucky. I love it. Yeah. And luckily nobody's ever asked me, Hey, could you send me a Pro Tool session? Never in a decade. Nobody's ever, ever, ever. No. Knock on and wood. That, you, that, that doesn't happen. A decade ago, that used to be a thing. Mm -hmm. it, everything was. Uh, Pro Tools session, can you do this in Pro Tools? It, it had to be Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody. Yeah, I may have missed one project in my life from not having Pro Tools. Just saying like, you know, I, I don't use Pro Tools anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're like, that was a deal breaker. But I like, what, one out of thousands? Yeah. Well, that had to have been a decade ago, right? Not anytime recently. Would have been in the past five years, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, not not worth dealing with <laughs> no. with that. I want to put in something that is maybe for the beginners to voiceover. A lot of people are, are self-taught in this stuff. What are some terms that you might hear in a session or talking with an engineer that the self-taught guy wouldn't know? Uh, yeah. Specialized lingo. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly there's, there's, there's specialized lingo. There's, there's stuff that you get as a voice action. Let's see what comes to mind. One thing that you get a lot from, from directors is, uh, could you, could you give me an ABC of a line? Could you give me uh, a three in a row of a line where they'll ask you to deliver a specific line with three different interpretations? They'll often call that and could you give me an ABC of it? And if you don't know what that means, it's, they want three different interpretations of the line. Uh, so, so don't start singing the alphabet. No, don't start singing the alphabet. <laughs> Sometimes you'll get, um, they'll ask you for wild lines, uh, which is, you know, uh, sometimes you want, they'll want you to be, uh, extemporaneous. That might be more interpretations of a particular line. Sometimes they'll want you to ad lib different lines, or could you just give us some wild, uh, you know, reactions to things, uh, depending on, on what kind of project it is. Um, you'll often, you'll often get that. So that could be like grunts or yeah, reactions. Yeah, certainly, certainly good Effort be. noises. Yeah, absolutely. And that's crazy because in my world, location sound, wild lines means dialogue recorded without video. Oh, interesting. Like like ADR on set. Right. Yes. Interesting. That'd be a wild line. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
sometimes the uh, the producer will want you to either back off the mic or they'll tell you to eat the mic. So sometimes they'll want to get that proximity effect and they'll want you to put the microphone like really close to the face or they'll tell you to eat the mic. Or they might say, you're eating the mic. Could you back off a little bit because we're getting too much proximity effect? What would your scripts be called? Is that copy? Yeah, you would. Yeah, typically you would say it, it's your copy. Um, sometimes it might say it's your sides. What are your sides? Uh, have you reviewed your sides yet? Um the portion of the script. Yeah, your portion, your portion of the script, uh, or it could be just a segment of this of the script. I, I made a whole video about like jargon a long time ago, and I'm trying to th- like I'm drawing a blank on what all those all those things are. Uh, but those are those are I, sort of the, the the chunky ones where a director will will give you. Those are the most common ones. How about some like if you send in an audition and they give you some notes, what are some common things that they'll reply maybe about the tonality of of the recording? Like if they say it's muffled, like something like that, does that come up? Uh, it usually doesn't come up. Usually if your audition has a problem, it goes in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> you almost never, it's really, really rare to get feedback. Can you rescind this with a little more air? No, you never get that. No. You never get that. When you're in the session after you've booked the gig, if a director is accustomed to working with actors on camera, they will often try and give you things to think about in order to deliver a line. So they'll say, could you do it more conversationally? Or could you put yourself, could you imagine a scene where this person is, you know, injured or they're about to hug you or, you know, to try and get you into a headspace for it in an effort to avoid giving you something called a line read. So a line read is where they say, could you say it like this? And then they say the way they hear it in their head and they want you to ape that back, but in your voice, but they're looking for a specific intonation. I often don't mind getting a line read. If they hear something in their head, I'll do my level best to try and get that for them. Makes some actors crazy though. But it does. Some actors really do hate it. And so a lot of times for... For on-screen actors, you're trying not to put yourself into their head. You're trying to get them into the headspace to in- inhabit the character, you know, so that so that they can get to that read. But for a lot of times for voiceover, we're like, we're going through it, right? I don't have, we don't do rehearsals a lot of times for for voice acting. The rehearsal is the, the last take because uh, we don't have to be, we don't have to memorize it. We don't have to be, quote, off book, um, you know, another term if you're off book. Uh, so we don't, we don't have that. So a lot of times I, I, I don't mind a line read, but some actors really like, don't give me a line read. Let me, let me figure it out. Cause they're, they're afraid. I'm going to need to hear a smile. Yeah. Yeah. So otherwise they'll, you know, some actors will be like, could you do it? Um, could you just be more empathetic? Uh, could you do it better next time? And, <laughs> you know, so, like what you did there, let's do it like 20% better. Yeah. But, uh, you know, sometimes a good director will, will provide a descriptive scene for you to try and get you into, into the headspace so that you, you know, you know what the, the scene is, you know, sometimes they'll say like, you know, pretend you're talking to your dad and you and your dad are out having a beer and blah, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And you're going to talk about the lawnmower that you're trying to promote. It, it might be. It's more empathetic, so they want you to slow down and use a softer voice. But yeah, a director will often try and get you to, to try and paint the scene in your head. And others just say, say it like this. Say it like this. I heard yeah. some really weird ad uh, recently. It was like, I don't, it was for investments or something like that. It was like two people having a conversation, but then like, halfway through both people had all the information to give the ad read and it was no longer a conversation like <laughs> oh you're going to such and such yeah and they they've got this great insurance thing and it's like it's like the writing just you know, fell apart that person was telling you about it why are you telling them <laughs> yeah for sure it's for sure uh, ads are weird yeah ads uh, are weird especially on the radio and yeah. stuff and now a lot you know uh, certainly if you watch enough youtube the uh the automated voices are really becoming a lot more, a lot more prominent, uh, where you can just the hear. TikTok voice is driving. Yeah. Like, well, like the TikTok voice and, you know, there are so many services out there where it's just, you know, text to speech and 
it's flat and emotionless and you know, it, they are what they are. Those customers probably weren't going to pay me for my voice anyway, so I don't really care about them, but you do see it a lot more, sort of that lowest common denominator where there there will be a model of somebody's voice that gets turned into uh, turned into a text to speech kind of thing. But everyone knows what that is. They hear it. Yeah. They know they're they're being lied to. Yeah. And sometimes they don't care, they don't care. but sometimes they do. Yep. And that's that's the decision they make before they put that voice out. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Mike, have you ever used Descript? Yeah. Or trained it and, and used it on a session to fix a word or anything like that? Uh, I have not had a ton of success using Descript to change uh, to change things. I have modeled my voice in Descript because I wanted to know how it worked. Um, I use Descript oftentimes for editing. It's, it's good for, it's good for editing, uh, for taking out, taking out words and stuff. I have, I've trained overdub probably five or six different times for different versions of my voice to see if I could get it to do anything. And I've never been I've never been particularly successful. Yeah. For it. I know that there are services that are that cost more and are more capable than something like Descript or Descript, however you say it. I think there are two use cases for it. One is so that a celebrity can license their face and voice for for work where they don't even have to show up. Uh, and so they can just have a body double do the motions and superimpose their face and their voice into it. And all of a sudden, George Clooney is speaking Spanish and Italian and all those things. Uh, and they get the lip flaps right. It looks like the actor. I think they've already done that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, th this is, I, this I, is out I there. Think, this is d d this I is think out. the latest uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, Ko Kenobi. I think yeah. Darth Vader was like a Descript sort of yeah. voice. Yeah. Synthesis it wasn't thing. James Earl Jones. It was the. It was software. credited. But it's got to be software because he's in his 80s now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Anthony Bourdain narrated Roadrunner posthumously. Okay. Really? That was a deep fake voice. It was a thing that went around like, wait a minute. Would, how would, did Anthony give permission? It was like his estate, maybe or maybe not. I forget what the what the outcome was. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a, it's a lot of deep fake voice for the, the narration he did for, for Roadrunner. I think there could be a, a good ethical use for it if you if you're a voice actor you train it with your own voice yeah and you've got it you're sick one day and if it's good enough you can oh not fall so far behind yeah. i'm not opposed to this technology at all believe me if there's a way that i could clone my voice in such a way that i could scale up the amount of work that i could do i'm limited if to i could make videos and and not have to shoot the video part of it right. and not have to do the voiceover or anything and maybe even get a better result because I'm not going to make any mistakes. mistakes. Yeah. I mean, My appearance on the show right now is a deep fake. <laughs> I've only deep faked you once. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the, I think that's the long term for, for Descript is, yeah. uh, is certainly maybe not the, maybe not the deep fake vision yet. I don't know if that's on right. their roadmap, but certainly narrating a PowerPoint uh, and, and editing on the fly where it's doing all that stuff where you're essentially just treating the voice like it's the output from a Word document. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally think that's there. And I don't begrudge that technology as long as I can retain control over the timbre of my specific voice, as long as I can control what happens with my voice. It's just intellectual property, right? It's just this, it's, yeah. you know. Mailbox money. As long as other people aren't doing it. Right. With your voice right. and not giving you a royalty. Right. And those of us, those of us who, who actually put our voice out in public, you know, all three of us, there's enough, there's a, a big enough corpus of our, of our voice out there that anybody sufficiently motivated probably could create deep fakes, but that's where you hope the law will prevent us from, uh, we could seek damages for such a thing. Cause it's really just like any other intellectual property. It's identity theft at that point too. Yeah. Yeah. On top of the IP issue. Yeah. Yeah, or just other people using your voice, making you say things right. that you didn't actually say. And then along with the video, I mean, we've already got like deep fakes of presidents saying things. Yeah. Well, there's also the uh, porn stuff. issue too, because they're making oh, yeah. videos of people that didn't make these videos. Well, yeah, I'm certainly like revenge, that. And, I, <laughs> revenge and girlfriend, you know, that, that, that's been yeah, problematic. The revenge stuff. Um, did you yeah. see, uh, a while back there was the, the, I haven't watched porn in a while. <laughs> no, the, uh, there was a, there was a deep fake channel that I think was made by the guys from South Park. The name escapes me, but essentially it was 
uh, uh, virtually a hundred percent of the characters and voices, it's all deep fakes, but it's like, you know, Donald Trump in a wig talking to Mark Zuckerberg. And there's all these varieties of different deep fakes. And it's really, uh, it's really, really fascinating because some of them are really, really good. And some of them are like intentionally bad, I think, but it was just sort of, and it's really about, it's meta about deep fakes, just sort of trying to get people to be aware of, of what it is. Um, it's yeah. really, I'm going to have to find whatever. that maybe if I get my brain off of it, uh, the, the, the channel will come back to me. Um, we got a bit away from the voiceover terms. Mm. I want to come back to one of them. Yeah. It's a technique that is pretty much exclusively used in voiceover. That's punch and roll. Can you explain that technique? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so punch and roll is a technique where you record and edit simultaneously and you leverage uh, the capability of the DAW so that when you're, when you're recording an audiobook, let's say you're recording a paragraph and in the second sentence of the paragraph, you go up, you make a mistake and you need to go back and redo that sentence. Sometimes people will just like snap their fingers or use a dog clicker and then they'll just repeat the sentence and keep going and they'll keep recording so that at the end they've got this really long body of material and they have to go back and cut out all of their mistakes and glue everything back together. With That is what I do. Oh, really? Yeah. I learned the click thing from you. Oh, really? <laughs> and and me and, and Ian Shepard now do it. So. Yeah, right. And for video, that it's actually, it works pretty well. For punch and roll... What you can do is as soon as you make a mistake, you stop and then you go back a few seconds, you hit play, you listen to yourself in the headphones in playback and you start talking to try and match your voice and cadence. And then as soon as that sentence ends and the, the new sentence starts, you hit record and you keep rolling. So you punch in at that point and you keep going. And if you do it right, the cadence and the separation between the sentences, assuming there's no latency in your headphones or anything like that, it should just keep rolling through. So by the time you get to that script end, you've edited. So all you need to do to, is go back. You might need to listen through to make sure that there's no mouth clicks, to make sure that the timing is actually perfect in between, but it significantly can adjust it can make the editing process a whole lot easier because you're pretty sure that by the ten by the time you've come to the end of your script, it's edited. Yeah, you're probably ninety nine percent there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crapple cr cross fades. That's sort of yep, thing. yep. Uh, you know, and that's it's it's for for voice acting. Our money is made on a what they call a per finished hour basis. So many many times, we we get paid for how long the finished MP3 is or the finished wave file. And if that takes us one time multiplier to make or five times multiplier to make a one hour of audio, does it take us two hours to make it five hours to make it or 10 hours to make it? We get paid the same. So our, our motivation is to get that time down as tightly as we can so that we make the most per, per finished hour and punch and roll is one way that we can do that uh, so that you can get it down to I usually call you know a multiplier of like two and a half times. You it takes you an hour to record it. If you're really doing it right, you should listen to that whole hour that you've recorded. But hopefully, all the editing is done at that point. So the better a cold reader you are, the better you are at reading that script cold and not making mistakes. Certainly, the faster it's going to go. And then, if you're doing punch and roll, it's edited by the time you're by the time you're done. So you can it can be a much faster way to get things done. Cool. Yeah. Is there any other techniques like that that you can think of that are kind of voiceover specific? We tend to use our tools a little bit differently than musicians. So for musicians, things like compressors practically become instruments. For voiceover, we want our compressor to be invisible. We don't want to know that something is being compressed. We just want it to be that they don't have to adjust their volume in the headphones. Uh, so we're just trying to level it and have it be really transparent. Likewise with a gate, we don't use a gate for artistic purposes. We do it really as just like a mild expander, just to try and get our noise floor down, just to try and take our breaths and diminish them a little bit. So many of our tools, we're trying to make them as invisible as possible rather than using them for creative effect. For most of the time, I, you know, I think if you get good at it, you really only need the effects 
that are like in a typical channel strip. So, you know, a basic EQ, a basic compressor and a basic gate is going to cover like 90% of your work. And then if you need to, then you would add, you know, something special like, uh, you know, like isotope to make certain fixes, or you might need a de or, or something like that. But really we, we try and make our effects as invisible as, as invisible as possible. Makes sense. Do you, do you record with effects? these days i don't no no i record i record just as pure microphone onto disc and do everything do everything after the fact uh i don't even like sweeten in my headphones or anything like that i don't have any like headphone monitoring uh, effects i thought you had a an avalon channel strip or something i do it's right right here uh but i it's often i bypass all of it i just use the preamp section I don't okay. do anything destructively to it. And the Avalon in particular is is fairly tricky to use because you got it doesn't have recall very well. I have to go through and write down every button and every knob. And because it's vacuum tube and they say it's got to warm up for 30 minutes, it might sound marginally different whether or not I've just turned it on or whether it's been on for, you know, for a couple of days. And certainly the more hours I put on the tubes, it may sound different. I've already had it retubed once. And so you run the risk that if you're coming back to a gig a year later, that your preamp won't even sound the same, which, you know, doesn't happen with the, the solid state stuff that we have. So yeah, my Avalon doesn't actually get as much use as it as it used to because it's come, it's jumped up and bit me a couple of times i haven't turned any of my rack gear on since i moved to this apartment over a mm. year ago so <laughs> <laughs> and and probably for the entire year before that yeah. and none of you know, none of my rack tube preamps mm. it used right right you know i i would recommend a lot of times a, like a dbx 286 to people but it was often people who were streaming where you need to have the effects right. in real in real time but every other time I'm like, just get it as pure from the mic and mess around with your settings after the fact. Don't, don't risk just doing something destructively on the way in. A misconfigured gate can really screw, really screw stuff up. Yeah. What's your favorite uh, voiceover mic and preamp combination at the moment? The one that's been getting the most use at the moment. There are two. This one right here. Um, this is the Telefunken TF11, like 800 bucks. I love the way this sounds. I've never had the privilege of standing in front of an AKG C12 or an old Telefunken C12. Uh, but this is supposed to be inspired, inspired by that. Uh, the other one is the one, if you're on, if you're watching it, there's the microphone right back there. That's the new, uh, Lewitt LCT 1040, um, which I don't know if you've seen anything about that, but it is like, 10 microphones in one it's a vacuum tube and a fet microphone and you can dial in how much of each you want and it's got like a dark setting and a bright setting and a modern setting and it's got every pattern um so it's really it's really flexible but the the recall is is pretty straightforward to it you know i just make notes i'm like okay you're going to be on a 20 percent you know 20 percent mix and you're in the super cardioid pattern and What's cool about it is like every every mic that comes off the line, they're already stereo matched. If it was an engineer's perspective, the 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 controls for the thing could be at the engineering desk, and the mic is just in front of the talent. Um, it's a really really flexible mic, but I like the I really like the way it sounds. It's it's expensive. It's it's crazy expensive. It's really good. It doesn't require a ton of warm up time. It warms up in like five minutes, so you don't have to worry too much about it. I don't love vacuum tubes for that, for that perspective. I like to just turn the mic on and start, and start recording. Uh, so that's, you know, why this Telefunken has been getting so much use recently. And then what preamp do you go into? I've been an audience guy forever. Um, so primarily I go into my, uh, I have an audience ID 44 right here. Um, so what you're, what you're hearing me over now, no, no effects or anything like that. So it's, they're super clean preamps easy super easy to work with so i have an an audient id 44 and then because of the youtube stuff that i do right in front of me is an audient asp 880 which is essentially just eight eight more preamps um and so the way it's actually I'm, i use it for two of the channels so when i do the mic shootouts they go into they go into they go into that and then all of these other preamplifiers these sort of boutique ones that i almost never turn on 
the remain there's four channels that I essentially use it as like a thousand dollar patch bay, which is stupid. Uh, but all of these, you know, all of these go into different different inputs on the back of the ASP eight eighty. So using it as an A to D basically yeah. and bypassing the yeah preamp bypassing game. the preamp yeah and just just using these preamps here. Uh, but there's you know the the hardware preamps they often. There's a couple of solid state ones that, that I use, uh, but the the Avalon is the one I use, the, the one I use least. Uh, I have over here. Um, and would '90s gear be considered vintage at this point? At this point, I guess yeah, it's on the oldie station. <laughs> this preamp, this is um, called a CLM Dynamics um, DB400. It's four preamps, of which I only ever use one channel. But that was made in the '90s, and I love the way I love the way it sounds. It's got a really nice. Um, gentle limiter for voiceover. So if I know I have to do a script for like the audio drama that I'm on where I know I'm going to have to scream, this limiter um, will often protect me and it's and it's really transparent. Um, there's the Avalon. This is the Camden um, EC2 uh, that uh, from Cranbourne Audio, they sent it to me, and I ended up liking it enough that I put it, I put it in my rack. And then there's a DBX two eighty six down there too that go into the into the audience. But ninety nine percent of my time, ninety nine percent of my time, I'm going through the the preamps in my ID forty four. That's my favorite. Yeah, the the interface preamps have gotten a lot, a lot better in the past five years, a right? Better. A lot better. Yeah, I I haven't gotten much experience with it yet, but I I did get the new um the new Rodecaster thing and, and those it's supposed to be like 76 db of clean gain and they've sent it to me and i've just haven't had a lot of time to to mess around with it uh but nice. but all the, by all accounts the preamps in that are out of this world because of youtube i've had the chance to use a lot of different mics so my my favorites tend to come and go the constants in my life have been um the sennheiser mkh 416 microphone which is shotgun mm -hmm. microphone I've got four of those. Yeah, right? So that's been a constant. Super yep. reliable, takes a beating, always sounds good. Never in the way of my copy. It's like impossible to put a plosive into it. I, I love it. I love the 416. Big fan. I have a Neumann U87 that gets very little use by comparison. I have um, um, the Lewitt, uh, the other Lewitt microphones, they have a the 540 Sub-Zero, um, which is... It sounds really good, very modern sounding, super, super crisp, no noise at all. Um, and you can set it not to clip. It's got like an automatic gain. Uh, so if you deliver the, the it, it, sort of, it sort of has like an auto gain setting in it. So you can press the press a button while you're delivering it and it will tell you if you need to pad the mic. Um, so that's that's helpful. And they, they sound great. The Lewitt mics have been really great. It's a great feature. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also have their 640, which isn't really for voiceover, but it's one of those ones that you can uh, you can adjust the pattern after the fa after the fact. There's a plug in, and so you can turn it from a cardioid to a super cardioid or to an omni after the fact. Uh, you can you can make it a mid side after it's a two. You can you can um, put an XLR to the to the back capsule and turn it into a, a mid side um, kind of deal because it can be multiple patterns like. There's some really cool stuff that's happening out there in, in microphones. There's, there's some cool stuff. I do have one other question, yeah. but I don't want to ask it uh, uh -oh. on <laughs> record. <be> good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. More YouTube business sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Mike, it's been so good to talk to you. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for your YouTube channel and yeah. being part of the Reaper community. Um, yeah. Thanks again. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We will see you in two weeks. See you later. See you next time.